very thankful to Dorothy and Kathy for allowing me to come to be a part of this. Um, so I'm a genetics researcher here at Washington University and, and very interested in understanding the genetic basis of skeletal malformations that include a spectrum of other disorders including Chiari malformation and syringomyelia. Um, we work very collaboratively. We know that this is a needs to be a big project. Um, there's been there have been many investigators who have been trying to understand the genetic basis of Chiari and occasionally there are some successes but we think we all need to work together. So there are three or four other researchers across the country that we're collaborating and working with. We did get a, a large grant from the University of Missouri Spinal Cord Injury Research Program that will help us coordinate the collection of lots and lots of patient samples. Most of that will be here locally um, through the clinics at Washington University where I work, um, but we're very interested in working with you. I've got, because we came here today, we have handouts out in the hall as well, so if you know of other people who might be interested, my, my contact information is on there. Um, it's easiest for us to recruit patients in person for our study. The study really is just a one-time involvement where we would tell you about the study. Um, we would draw a DNA sample either from blood or from spit, um, collect family history to see if there's anyone else in the family that has these disorders. Um, we think there's kind of a broader, so we, we ask a lot of questions about other things like um, joint hypermobility, so we know there's a subset of individuals who have Chiari malformation who have, who can do some of the interesting things with their joints that other people can't. Um, and so we do like to collect some of that additional information, just hoping we can understand this better by maybe understanding what subgroups might be within this um, very large field. Um, the study is really, there's no cost to you, there's no other follow-up. Um, we do, you know, potentially like to get release of information or medical records to kind of further document the, the type of malformation that, um, or Chiari that's present. Um, but I thank you for letting us come here today. We'll be here until, at, you know, 12 or later if people are still interested. I, we have, I have two coordinators in a room kind of down the hall so we can get your history. In private, we can do the enrollment and collect DNA samples here today if you're interested, but again, you have my contact information too, so we'll, please feel free to contact me as well. You know, during the rest of the year, we'll probably be coming to a lot of the clinics here at Washington University, um, so that'd be another way that we'll, we're hoping to enroll a lot of patients too. Um, anybody have any questions here, or if not, I'm happy to take questions um, anytime this morning. All right, thank you very much. I just wanted to introduce myself. I am Dorothy Poppy, and I do run the Chiari and Swing by Yilly Foundation. And I'm not a hack fundraiser. I actually have a child who was diagnosed way back in 1991 at four years old. He's now 30 years old. Um, so I'm kind of like a grandma in this <laughs> organization. Um, been here a long time. I also have a dog who has Chiari malformation and who has had surgery. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I can speak to the canine or the human end of it. Um, which there, there's a whole breed of dogs, um, King Charles Cavalier Spaniels, and some other small breed dogs tend to, to uh, get this. But we have a veterinarian in um, Long Island, New York, who cares for people's pets. It's not research projects. It's where they actually take care of the dogs and do surgery. Um, but we call it comparative medicine because you can actually learn a lot of things from the animals that you can apply to human medicine. So it's a really fantastic collaboration. Um, through being a grandma for this, what I've learned most is that it takes a village. It takes the community to make this work. It's never one person, it's never one doctor, it's never one researcher, it's how do we bring everybody together to make us all work together, and you're part of that. You have to realize that you really do have a strong voice, and because you're here today, you want answers. So don't go home and just say, okay, well, I'm gonna wait for, the, for whoever to figure it out for me. You have to become part of it. And if you do, we're gonna get there a lot faster. So I want to tell you just a little bit about our organization, what we've been doing, and it's now your organization since you're here today. Um, today is our inaugural meeting with Dr. David Limbrick, 
in the back. So thank you for hosting us. And Carrie has been phenomenal. Um, this is the first of many meetings here. And we're going to get a bigger room, I'm told, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we just didn't know how many people were coming today. And I think it's great that we're actually a little bit lessening at the seams. That's, that's great news. Um, I want our uh, chapter reps to stand up because you have to know their faces. So Leslie is actually um, Missouri, Central Missouri chapter, yes. correct? All right, so it, um, where are you from exactly? I live in Osage Beach, down at Lake the Ozarks, so kind of right in the middle of the state. So if any of you are nearer that area, you can talk to Leslie. And I'm on Facebook if you guys and want to And Facebook, find me. okay, so there you go. And we have, um, let, let's see, JJ Hardin who she just disappeared in the back. JJ is going to be part of your St. Louis group here. Lynn Harwick. Tara Lynn. Tara Lynn, I'm sorry. Okay, Tara Lynn Hardwick. I have to get to know everybody here too, because this is our first meeting, so um, my apologies that I haven't been out before this, but we will get to know each other. So th those are your representatives in this area. Did I get everybody? No, Christy. Christina. Christina, Christina. Mm -hmm. You just signed on today, correct? Yes. So that's why, okay, so that's great. So they'll be your chapter reps. They're going to need your help, though, with uh, organizing things in the area. So please reach out to them, let them know you're interested in helping in whatever way you can, and they will find something really great for you to do. Um, CSF. CSF has been around since 2007, but it's with people who have been um, looking for answers, like I said, I've been st I started in 91. Um, my son back then, he had uh, two major surgeries. He has two shunts. He had uh, decompression twice. Um, he was uh, low tone. He, he had a, a lot of breathing difficulties. He was doing not really well. And um, he, I am happy to say he is now 30. Um, he's six foot five. He's doing his PhD in physics, and uh, you know he had graphic motor skill and coordination, so he did a lot of math in his head, so there's a blessing in everything, and now he's a physicist. So I'm ready to go to that graduation this year. Um, right? <laughs> so there, there, there's a rainbow at the end. Um, we, our organization is also a really positive thing. Um, surgeons go out and they're all trying their best to do the best for their patients every time. It's not always an optimal outcome for everybody. You know, we hope it is for everybody, but it always isn't. So uh, one of the rules for CSF is you cannot doctor bash. If you're going to come on the site and say so-and-so is whatever, you can't do that. You can find answers, but we're not going to just complain and keep bad stuff going. Um, we're the only organization out of the Kiari groups that actually has the BBB seal. What that means is we adhere to 20 rigorous standards. Of, um, we're transparent. <coughs> we fund the programs that we say we're going to fund. The percentages of what you're supposed to spend on fundraising, administration, and programs, we adhere to all of that. So when, when you donate your dollar, you know your dollar is going to the right places, and the BBB <coughs> checks up on us. We also have the Han code. Health on the net takes 18 months to get that. We're the only group right now that has that. What that means is they come in and they check our information and did we actually go through it and state who said it and cite the articles and things it came from. So it's reliable. Um, it's not made up by somebody who thinks that's the way it should be. So when you send somebody to our site, it's good information and that's important to us. Um, Third thing, we have the guide to our gold seal, and a number of charities do have that. We're, I'm sure they're coming out with a platinum and they're going to upgrade us. So basically, you should know that we're a good charity that you're involved with, and be proud of it when you talk about us. What do we do? We um, have a three-pronged mission statement. We educate, we generate awareness, and we do uh, fund research. So how do we do that? Education. We host these medical lectures. We have over 200 lectures on our webs right now. To come in and film and do what we do here and upload them and keep the web maintained and all that costs, costs money. 
We have um, over 200 of those on the web now at um, 27 locations from around the United States. So that's pretty good. And the interesting thing, I think the really great statistic from this is that we had about a half a million people access our videos for free and whatever from 144 countries from around the world. So maybe there are only, you know, 50 of us here in the room, but it, it's, it's information for everybody. So um, we think that that's the best way to get the word out for education. Um, awareness, we have Kathy, our cheerleader for the walks. You guys can get out and do that. We also host four events, four major events a year. One is um, coming up in New York, and it's the CSF Casino Night. So it's about 200 people. If anybody feels so inclined to visit New York, just let me know. Um, it's a lot of fun. We, it's uh, cocktails. This year we're doing like a James Bond theme, so it, it should be a really, a really fun evening. Um, the second event that we do is the Bobby Jones Classic in Atlanta, Georgia. If any of you are golfers, um, Bobby Jones, the famous amateur golfer, won the Grand Slam. He had syringomyelia. And back in the day, um, he did not want to admit that he was handicapped or disabled because that was seen as um, a flaw. So he wanted to be remembered for his golf, not his disease. The Jones family has since come on board with our organization <coughs> and actually licensed the name and likeness to us because we're very, very careful about how we uh, promote the name. Through that, though, we're able to um, bring in this huge group of golfers to East Lake, where the FedEx Cup is held there, which is like a really prominent place. So it's, um, it's a part of Atlanta history, and it's a great event. If you're golfers or know people who want to get involved with that, let me know. We have um, Dinner Dance for a Cure, which is in Cleveland with Kathy. That's been going on since our onset, and it's a fun night, uh, raffles and prizes. We're adding an event this year in Chicago, um, Shine a Light on CSF, and that's going to be in October as well. Where's Kathy? What's the date? October 8th. October 8th, for Chicago. Thing, for Chicago. So that's a new one that's up and coming. Brand new if you want to get on board with that. And our final and our biggest um, fundraiser for CSF is the Night of Light Gala. And that this year will be in Washington, D.C. We host it at Anderson House. It's a very expensive night. It's $1,000 it's, um, a seat and up. So um, we have 100 guests, and we don't do one raffle. We don't do any fundraising at the event whatsoever. But those 100 guests end up raising for us, like last year it was $350,000 without a raffle without because they understand what we're doing for a cause so that's our big event um, for fundraising and that generates a lot of awareness too and then research we're doing um, a number of things we're hosting the think tank meeting in April Dr. Lindbergh's going to be there too um, we have a two-day event with that the first day is our uh, common data elements project day and we're working on an international registry which I'm sure you probably read about for us. Um, prior to doing that, we started working with the NIH on creating common data elements. And, and what that means really simply is that if you have two, um, two ways of writing a birth date, I'm gonna use some, right? You can write the, the numbers, or you can write May 19th, and then if you ask two computers to talk to each other or whatever, they can't talk because it's not this, the same language. So what the NIH and the NINDS have challenged our group to do is to come up with a dictionary of terms for research, whether it's Chiari syringomyelia, how do you measure a Chiari, where do you measure it from, what kind of a scan do you use. So to come up with this dictionary that researchers can then go to the dictionary and say, I want to study this, oh, I think I'll pick these elements to study. But then when they put them in the big registry, it'll all be able to talk to each other and you'll actually be able to compare apples to apples. So it's a fantastic project that really is going to change um, the way research has been done 
and hopefully uh, Dr. Limbrick's also a part of that project. So um, th I think that's the project I'm most proud of. And then we're hosting three um, research meetings. So one is at Brown, where uh, there's a million dollar grant that was given that CSF is shepherding up there, and they're looking at optogenetics, and that basically a way to um, turn off and on CSF production through light. So it's some cutting edge stuff. That's on June 24th and 5th, and we're doing a walk with it. So if people want to come up and learn more or see more about those projects, um, you're welcome to come. You can see that on the website. Johns Hopkins is doing a half-day seminar for us May 15th. So that's a whole lecture series. Um, Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC, on March 24th is doing um, an education series with us for doctors, nurses, PAs, residents. So it's going to be a medical learning session down there. Um, I think I covered them all. I th think I did it. But, it. but as you can see, like that's a lot of stuff, right? And guess how many we have on staff? So um, we need you. you know? <laughs> that's it. We have three full-time employees on staff. And uh, we're, we're really, really, really trying to move this forward for you guys. If you have any questions or you want to learn more, please call the office. We're there. We're there. So do you have any questions for me today? Kind of a quick overview. Okay. So now, actually, this is the moment you've all really come here for. It's Dr. David Limbrick. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him for a few years now. Um, I don't know if you all know, so you all know he's a pediatric neurosurgeon, but he has his degree in biology, his degree in physiology, I want to get them all right, and pharmacology, which I didn't know. So that, that actually makes him an even better doctor because he understands all, all, of, all of the aspects of how the, the medications and all are going to work through you, and I, like that's super knowledge. Um, he, he has single-handedly also um, brought in a PCORI grant, like a patient-centered outcomes research initiative. Is that right? Did I get it right? I think so. Um, two, so 2.8 million, 2.8 million dollars. And he's uh, running this out here, and it's going to answer one of the the big questions for us. So I'm going to let him talk about that, but he is the mover and shaker in the field. Um, we're very grateful to have him on our board, and it's always my pleasure to be in the same place as Dr. Limbrick. So, Dr. Limbrick. I'm so impressed by all of you making it here because negotiating this campus is a little bit tricky, <laughs> parking at any of three or four different parking lots and so forth. So, thank you so much for coming. Can't, uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Uh, I also see a number of uh, familiar faces out there, and um, so thanks for coming and you know still talking to me after all this. So. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to be a little bit of an informal person, so I, you know I'd like you to stop you know have this as an informal conversation. I do have some slides prepared, and I'm happy to go through them all as we you know talk through them but please stop me ask me questions I, I really kind of favor more of a discussion format than, than a lecture um, but in any case so I am David Limbrick I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon here at Washington University uh, just a little background I'm from Virginia born and raised uh, but I've been here for 15 years with my family um, and <coughs> have been interested in Chiari and syringomyelia since about 2003 when I saw my first patient as a resident and uh, since that time I've dedicated a large portion of my professional life uh, to studying this and the mysteries and unraveling everything we can about this. The, the answer at the end of this is we still have a lot to learn. Um, and I'm actually, I hadn't intended to talk about this PCORI grant, so I'll just kind of address that at the very beginning. Um, I always tell people that whether you participate in some of the research we do or not, that's up to you, and I sort of try to keep it out of my thinking when I'm thinking of you guys as patients. So uh, I'll just mention it, it's, a, it's a trial where we are comparing the two most common treatments for a QRED compression, um, and it turns out that 
if you really look at this, the complication rate for KRE surgery, as many of you may know, is actually quite high. Uh, and what we're trying to do is define that kind of ver variant of the surgery that we do, which minimizes harm to patients uh, and maximizes effectiveness. Uh, it sounds pretty basic, uh, but right now, everything that we've done in terms of the literature and the information about surgical treatment of Chiari is based on how somebody was trained to do it by the person who was trained to do it before them. And in general, these things are not always the best ways to make uh, sound medical decisions. So we're trying to help fill out the literature with what we call level one data, which is the best possible data. And, and it's really for the patients. Um, it'll help us as physicians to treat patients, but really it's to provide information to those patients so they can make informed decisions about their own health. The other uh, study that, that Dr. Grinnett spoke about earlier is uh, that we're trying to unravel the genes uh, that are involved in these disorders so we can um, better understand how they're passed, how they develop, and how they can be treated in the future. So uh, I am going to talk about some of the clinical research studies we've done along the way to help learn more about it many of which I see some familiar faces in the room that, that have uh, participated in these studies. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, maybe this is a good opportunity to see uh, how, how your uh, commitment has made a difference. So uh, with that, you know, I, I sort of wanted to just kind of talk about history for a second. Um, because Chiari malformation, uh, believe it or not, was initially described in the 1890s by Dr. Hans Chiari in the Czech Republic, Prague. And since then, his classification really still holds. It's hard to believe, right? We have advanced MRI with diffusion tensor imaging and all these things. But really, it's the description in 1890 that still holds. Uh, he talked about four different kinds of, of Chiari malformation. And we're only going to focus on one type, which is type 1, and some of the variations that go along with it. We're not going to focus on Chiari 2 mal malformation, which is associated with spina bifida for the most part. Chiari 3, which is a very severe uh, uh, abnormality and oftentimes is not consistent with life. And Chiari 4, which is when the cerebellum just doesn't really develop very well. We're going to focus on Chiari type 1. So uh, a as I'm sure all or many of you know, um, Chiari 1 malformation is characterized when the base of the cerebellum, these tonsils, project down into the cervical spinal canal. Um, and we frequently think about this as congenital or developmental, although there are some ways you can acquire it over time with hydrocephalus, for example, or brain tumors. But for the most part, what we're talking about is developmental or congenital Chiari 1 malformation, which is a high incidence of syringomyelia that goes along with it. And I'll circle back on that in just a little bit. And Chiari 1, as many of you I'm sure know, has many associations. Uh, some of those associations are with known genetic disorders like neurofibromatosis um, or other things that we don't quite understand yet, like cranial synostosis or uh, various other uh, abnormalities that you see listed here. So, for example, uh, metopic synostosis or occult spina bifida, not the kind that's open, but the kind that's hidden underneath the skin. So there are lots of things that go along with Chiari, and we're learning more and more about this. Much has been made about um, the five millimeter cutoff for a Chiari. Can you raise your hand if you heard five millimeters is the cutoff for, for Chiari? So, so that's the most common definition I think neurosurgeons across the country <coughs> use. And it turns out that this five millimeter cutoff is based on 25 patients published in 1986. So that's, what, that's our threshold. And this is a little bit of statistical mumbo jumbo, but if you look at five millimeters of tonsil projection into the spinal canal, you have very good sensitivity and specificity. But if you go to four millimeters, which is you know trivial distance different, you still have excellent specificity and sensitivity. And really, it's not until you drop down um, quite a bit and have only marginal tonsil projection where uh, it becomes a little more questionable. But that being said, not everybody that has five millimeters is symptomatic. Um, and that's what this poorly projecting graph on the right shows, is that if you look through all these different publications over the years, uh, there are probably about 15 or more percent of patients that have that tonsillar position down low um, that, that don't have symptoms per se. So five millimeters, the take home message here is five millimeters is what we use 
clinically, but it may not be the best definition and we're not really sure what that is. So it's a moving target. Um, and, and you'll see physicians practice in, in, in very various ways. So um, the symptoms that we commonly associate with Chiari malformation, of course, headaches, and we call these tussive headaches, they tend to be worse with a sneeze or a cough. Visual changes, um, weakness, um, trouble swallowing, uh, trouble articulating your words, that's dysarthria, uh, swelling behind the eyes, hoarseness, <coughs> ringing or buzzing in your ears. This is the sort of medical list of these definitions, but more recently a patient reported list has been published and that's what this is here. This is from a, a large registry online where people can go on and, uh, and enter their own information about the symptoms they have. Um, and headaches, uh, of course, are prominent, but you also see that there is a, a high percentage of people who have ringing or buzzing in their ears, uh, hearing loss, uh, blurred vision, <coughs> balance difficulty, uh, trouble swallowing, um, uh, nausea, uh, trouble sleeping is a prominent component, um, and um, all sorts of other issues, including fatigue. Now, of course, there are a lot of things in life that can cause some of these symptoms, so to parse out what is related to the Chiari and what is related more diffusely, some other things uh, can be challenging, but certainly these are convincing that some of these symptoms are frequently associated with Chiari. So. Uh, this is, I encourage you to take a look at this. Uh, this is in the literature. Fishbein is, uh, is the author and you'll see, you'll see this information. Now, if you've been reading online about Chiari 1 malformation, you may have run across two other things that I want to talk about. One is a Chiari 1.5 malformation and a Chiari 0. Now, a Chiari 1.5 malformation is a Chiari 1 malformation, but with an additional problem and that is that the brain stem, which is this very important structure in the brain, has actually also drifted down below the frame and magnum. And that tends to mean that you might have more prominent symptoms, but more importantly, when you have surgery, you're more likely to not have a great response to surgery. So this is what we now term the complex Chiari. Sometimes these uh, folks will need uh, additional surgery, like fusions of the junction of, of the head and the spine, uh, and revision surgery for their decompression. Now there's another abnormality called a Chiari Zero, and Chiari Zero is, I would say, an emerging diagnosis. Um, it was initially described about five years ago uh, based in a, you know, a very small number of patients. And really what this is is syringomyelia, again the fluid uh, accumulating within the spinal cord uh, in the absence of the tonsils projecting downward. Uh, and this group of investigators who are very prominent in the Chiari world at University of Alabama described this uh, condition, and when they did surgery in a highly selected group, these people tended to, to do better with surgery and improved. You can see, in, again, a highly selected group, but um, greater than 80% improved. So uh, this is uh, a little bit of an overwhelming slide, and I just want to focus your attention on the right here. And this is just to say that, you know, traditionally, from 1891 on, we've been looking at the degree of cerebellar tonsil position down below the base of the skull. But we are finally becoming a little bit more astute with respect to other observations that can uh, give us information about disease course or how people are going to respond to treatment. And one example is this clivus canal angle here, or we, we call it CXA for short. Uh, but basically, if this angle is too sharp, uh, it tends to mean that the, the junction between the head and the spine is a little too extreme. And in those cases, they would be more likely to do poorly with surgery or require additional treatments. So again, I don't want to get too much into details. I'm happy to answer any questions about these things, but just sort of wanted to make everybody familiar with them. Similar, similarly uh, is the uh, PB2 line, PBC2 line, which is another uh, metric just for looking at the angle, not just at the back of the spine where these, these tonsils project, but also at the front of the spine sometimes this C2 can indent or uh, lean backward into the spinal cord and cause problems that compound those of, of, of a Chiari. So shifting gears a little bit to syringomyelia. Um, I, I know that many or all of you are familiar with this term, the accumulation of fluid within the context of the spinal cord itself. Now it's normal, of course, to have fluid outside the spinal cord. We don't typically think of it as normal to have fluid within the spinal cord beyond a very trivial amount. 
This is a very uh, uh, common problem among those folks with Chiari 1 malformation. Um, about 10 or 20 percent of patients with Chiari malformations, whether or not they're symptomatic, have this. And if they are symptomatic from their Chiari, they have a very high rate of syringomyelia. Overall, though, this is still considered a rare disease, uh, and it can be uh, associated with a number of neurological problems, um, but typically pain, numbness in the arms or, or legs. Um, or uh, inability to pick up uh, things or button your shirt because of poor sensation, uh, and sometimes what we call neuropathic pain, which is pain mediated by the nerves in the affected extreme extremities. Now the causes of uh, uh, syringomyelia are myriad. Um, uh, of course, we're here mainly to talk about Chiari, but there are other causes. Uh, and then there is, when we can't uh, find a cause, we call it idiopathic syringomyelia. Um, but in each case, we have to look, look and think carefully about what might be causing this room myelia. And with that in mind, uh, as Dr. Gurnett said, we are trying to do a better job defining the genetic etiology of Chiari and syringomyelia. A lot of this work has been uh, uh, done at, uh, at Duke uh, by um, a close friend of Dorothy's, uh, Allison Ashley Koch. Um, and uh, uh, she's uh, a collaborator on all of these projects, the CDE project that Dorothy mentioned, uh, the genetic project that we're talking about here today, and, and various other things. But um, she has really pushed the field of understanding the genetic etiology uh, of this forward. Uh, she's used a number of different uh, complex genetic techniques and statistical techniques to identify what genes could be involved. Uh, and those involve uh, genes um, involved in bone development and in connective tissue disorders uh, and in uh, growth and differentiation of various parts uh, and tissues. Um, so we're learning uh, a lot about this. Uh, we also are learning from a specific breed of dog that's affected by this uh, uh, complex of conditions very commonly. And uh, so we're bringing all of these things to bear to see if we can do a better job of understanding uh, what causes these problems. Yes. Just out of curiosity, what specific dog, breed of dog is that? Dorothy? King Charles Cavalier Spaniels. They're um, really cute. They're, they're not, I shouldn't say, they're very cute. They're not so bright, but they're. <laughs> they're the most edible dog breed of dogs. Okay. Yeah. They are the most lovely little animals. They're cute. Yes, ma'am. What does it mean? So what I mean by that is if you look at um, people just in general with Chiari and Stringomyelia, we like to say that about 10 or maybe even up to 12% of patients will have a sibling or a parent with, with the, uh, one of those conditions. And that percentage goes up a little bit in fraternal twins and up even higher in identical twins. And that sort of, to us, is indirect evidence that there may be a, a genetic um, similarity that could be leading to it. So um, there are a lot of different physicists and engineers and neurosurgeons who are looking into how um, syringomyelia may result from a Chiari malformation. And I'm not going to go into any detail about this other than to say that these are highly complex fluid mechanics and all these crazy things. Uh, but there, there are theories from 1958 uh, onward, 1958, 69, up all the way <coughs> to about five years ago. These people are, are, are uh, theorizing on why you, why you might have syringomyelia, but we really still don't have a great example or a, a great understanding of why that, why that might be. Um, <coughs> we, we do know also that, um, that syringomyelia does associate with uh, spinal deformity, and again, this makes us think about the, the genes that may be involved, and I know that Dr. Gurnett has some thoughts about this with respect to connective tissues. Um, and uh, it turns out that there is a, a relationship between syrinx size or syrinx diameter and spinal deformity in young patients uh, that, that seems to uh, uh, vary in parallel. So uh, for us, in this study that we did, that critical threshold appeared to be about uh, six millimeters. There are other groups that have studied this and says, well, it's not a crisp threshold. There may be a linear relationship. But there's definitely a relationship between spinal deformity and the syrinx. 
Is it uncommon <coughs> to develop uh, Sphinx post decompression? Uh, I would say that's less common, uh, but, but I, I've definitely seen that happen. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk a little bit about this, but there's something abnormal about the way that the fluid flows between the head and the spine mm -hmm. before surgery that we believe underlies um, how syringomyelia develops. That being said, I've seen it from scar tissue or other problems. Um, you can see it, it come up it secondarily cause some flow disturbance there and lead to syringomyelia. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Is there, is there a cause effect in serotonin and scoliosis, one cause the other? So there are theories, and I would say the most prominent theory is that the, the nerves that help to um, power those muscles in the center of the back, and therefore may play a role in stabilizing the back, um, they, this is the predominant theory, is that by weakening those muscles, in an you know an inconsistent way, it leads to uh, a curve in one direction or another. But that's mainly just speculative, and you know it could be that what we're talking about is there's a gene that sort of is common to both. Yes, ma'am. I know in our case, um, my son he had straight spine until he was three, <laughs> and then like in one day he went from straight to a thirty degree curve. And that's when we found he had the steering and the Chiari. So we didn't really talk <coughs> about that, but a lot of times, uh, I would say a, a large percentage of the times, I, I would guess somewhere on the order of 20, 30 or more percent, it's the scoliosis that leads to the diagnosis of the Chiari and Syrinx. That's very common. And there's certain triggers in oftentimes orthopedic surgeons or pediatricians be the ones to do the initial evaluation and there are certain warn or red flags, warning signs uh, that they should check an MRI scan and look for this and you know, there's a whole component of those and I, I can I actually have it in a different slide that I didn't plan to talk about but for example if the curve is oriented a different direction or if there is uh, what we call kyphosis like this instead of just side to side curvature uh, there's a whole group of things that sort of prompt orthopedic surgeons to check an MRI scan looking for this specifically. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what can you tell us about um, Charcot's joint? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I think that it, in my experience or, or, or what mm -hmm. I know about this is there is an association. Uh, maybe there's poor innervation related to syringomyelia that can contribute to that. Um, and we definitely see that. Um, I treat mainly children, so I have not seen that as much, much well, but I'm 75. <laughs> yeah, but, but for sure that it has to do with innervation to the extremities being jeopardized by, in most cases, by the syrinx, and, um, you know, it I, kills the nerves. It, it tends to, that's right, it causes neural injury, right? Whether it's reversible or not, I think, is yet to be, uh, yet, to, yeah, it's yet to be really delineated. <coughs> So I wanted to kind of show you this because as we talk about why syringomyelia may form in the setting of, uh, of Chiari, there's a lot of people who believe that it is pulsatility. Um, in other words, may or, you may or may not know that your brain is pulsating right now. With every heartbeat, your brain pulses. Uh, and it's something that as neurosurgeons we've become kind of accustomed to, but might be a, sort of surprising to you. It's, it's pumping right now. And um, you can imagine that if that's true and the skull is fixed, that that pulsatility is being projected out through those cerebellar tonsils. And there are people who believe, and I am one that believes that it's contributing to the generation of syringomyelia. So let me show you why that is. Um, there are a number of <coughs> MRI scans that are useful in the diagnosis and sort of understanding of Chiari. Of course, the ones that I showed you before are the standard ones, but then there are what we call dynamic imaging or a CSF flow study, and I'm sure many of you have heard this term, CSF flow study. And that's on the left here, the semi phase contrast flow study. Many physicians use this to understand whether, number one, a Chiari decompression may be helpful. Uh, in other words, if, if the, you have tonsils in an abnormal position but you have good flow, does that mean you would benefit from surgery? I don't think that's entirely clear, um, uh, but certainly this is a metric that we put into uh, the decision-making process. Um, and the other sequence that we've been using more recently is this true FISP, um, and 
the name of it is not important, but I wanted to show you this video. It's only about 15 seconds long, so I'll play it again. Uh, but uh, this is a patient uh, before surgery, and you can see the base of the skull is here. So these cerebellar tonsils have, uh, are ectopic, or meaning their position is below the level of the frame and magnum. And then you can see this very large syrinx here. So I'm going to play the video here. So you can see those tonsils really pushing downward with each heartbeat. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. And you can see even if I play it again, now look at the syrinx, you can see that the syrinx expands afterwards. So just after the tonsils coming down. See it compressed actually. Uh, and then after surgery, um, there is, you can see that there's space here from the decompression procedure and the tonsils are not moving here. This right here is a, the flow through the artery itself that's located. <coughs> but the tonsils are now decompressed and there's normal flow, meaning that it's not pistoning down like it has So been. the syrinx is no longer right, there exactly. on that Right, exactly. Wow. So we're learning that tonsil repulsatility seems to be important and diminishing tonsil repulsatility seems to be uh, a good indicator that the decompression has been adequate. So, and this just shows this in graphical uh, form here. One of the other things that uh, has been developed recently is something called the CSI, not the TV show, uh, the uh, <laughs> Chiari Severity Index. Uh, and this is by um, one of our residents here, Jacob Greenberg, and you'll see he's been prolific and really effective in generating a lot of these, these information that I'm going to show you today. Um, but basically, one of the things that I think you guys may all be familiar with is that it's not easy for physicians to tell you what exactly might get better after surgery, what you can expect to get better, how you're going to do after surgery. And one of the things that we thought might be useful is to develop a scale in order to tell you these sorts of things might get better, these things might be more challenging to fix. And, and just so you understand and can be able to un, you know, sort of <laughs> figure, um, to expect, uh, have a reali realistic expectation of, of uh, how things are gonna go after surgery. Um, so, uh, so Jacob went through and listed a bunch of kind of typical symptoms for Chiari, um, what, what he called the Chiari headache, which we typically think of as a a headache towards the back of the head, oftentimes worse with a cough, as I mentioned. Uh, and then he looked at other kinds of headaches, were they on the side of the head, the front of the head, um, were there signs of brainstem dysfunction, and for that, a vocal cord uh, or hoarseness, a vocal cord paralysis, problems swallowing, or what he called myelopathic symptoms, milo meaning uh, related to the spinal cord, so that would be numbness or tingling in the uh, arms or legs, uh, uh, neuropathic pain, for example, and he went through and uh, this was the first uh, of a very few uh, number of uh, articles that actually asked for patient input and in how, how people are doing. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But he sent out a survey um, and to ask how people were doing, how satisfied were you with your surgery, how do you feel like your over overall health is at this standpoint, and went through in some advanced statistical methodologies and developed a, a grading scale which included clinical parameters, and by that it's headaches, how you're doing, and then radiographic parameters from the MRI scan. And the most important thing on the MRI scan was the syrinx size, and that's why I've come back to this a few times, at least in, in this study. So uh, after, again, a statistical analysis and uh, different techniques, he developed uh, an integrated Chiari severity index, which essentially uh, grades people into one, two, or three, grades patients into grades one, two, or three, and it helps you to understand how you might do after, after surgery. So, for example, if you have a Chiari headache, so one at the back of the head, and you don't have frontal or temporal headaches, um, and if you don't have uh, myelopathic symptoms, which again would be, for example, numbness and tingling, then you had a 81% chance of doing excellent or nearly excellent in terms of your outcome. If you had a more diffuse headache, like a frontal temporal headache, um, or if you had numbness and tingling, um, or weakness of your extremities, um, you might expect a slightly lower rate of <coughs> having an excellent outcome according to the questionnaire that we sent out, and I'm sure that many of you filled that questionnaire out. 
Um, and then uh, people who were, had the lowest rate of, of improving after surgery were those who had, again, frontal or temporal headaches, uh, myelopathic symptoms, or missing tingling, or large syrinx. So this is just one of the sort of instruments to help understand how you might do uh, at, after surgery. And this is something that uh, is now kind of taken off across the country, at least in pediatric neurosurgery offices. This is a pediatric scale um, in order to help uh, prognosticate how, you, how people will do after a decompression surgery. Now the other thing Jacob did is he went back and said, wait a second now, how do we know if people are getting better after all these procedures we're doing? And it's sort of funny, he went back and looked at all the papers in the literature and said, you do better with this surgery, you do better here, or uh, this is helpful, or this isn't. And he found that, believe it or not, physician gestalt, which is the physician's impression, was the number one outcome metric. And um, so basically, if you come in, and, and as you know, as neurosurgeons, we spend five or 10 minutes in with you, and, and that is a very small portion of time in, in your overall health. So we may have not the best impression of how you're doing um, because we're not there with you uh, as you're suffering at home or, or, or whatever. So it turns out that our major uh, way we judge our success as surgeons is with our own impression, which is probably not the best way to do it. Um, uh, just a minority of, of articles in the literature used a standardized scale, and those standardized scales were not used, not used previously for Chiari, for example, uh, or not specifically for Chiari. Or very few uh, of these studies even described what kind of symptoms people were having if they had headaches or weakness in the arm or, or whatever. So um, it, it, just, it turned out that um, only 6.8% of the studies in the, of the, in the medical literature even asked patients how they were doing. Um, and only a third of the articles went through and said, did you have any new symptoms after <coughs> Chiari surgery, which I, if, you've, if you had Chiari surgery, you know that oftentimes new symptoms do come up. And um, only 4% used an outcome tool that had been used in Chiari in a serious way. So uh, he um, put this together, and, and essentially we learned a lot about this. It basically, the way that we're seeing how our patients how they're doing, the ways that we do that, very, very poor, and we need, need to improve this. And um, So there are a few different tools, um, but really uh, none that can be used in a prospective way, in other words, to hand you a questionnaire and say, how are you doing today, and then to compile it over time. Um, some of uh, our colleagues in Vanderbilt created, again, for pediatric neurosurgery, the CHIP, which is the Chiari Health Index in pediatrics, which is a quality of life tool. Again getting away from did you have a wound infection and did you need more surgery and switching a little bit to how are we doing overall, how's your health, were you able to get back to school, um, are you having pain, uh, are you able to do those things that you would love to do. So um, next I kind of wanted to talk about treatment of, of Chiari and Syringomyelia and I know that many of you are familiar with these but I thought it might be useful to review these and kind of give you our perspective about it, and you can ask us anything you'd like. Uh, as you know, there are very um, few conservative measures that we can do to, um, to help in a significant way with Chiari, syringomyelia. There are some medications that, can, that are effective in, um, in cases. Physical therapy, I think, can be very effective in some cases. Um, and just giving a tincture of time, at least in the, uh, in the pediatric population, can be enough, but, but frequently those things are not enough and surgery is required. It, it's really a disease of surgery. Um, and what are the surgical tools that we can bring to bear to help with uh, Chiari uh, malformation? Uh, posterior fossa decompression, also known as a Chiari decompression, is probably the most common one that we think about and that, 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 um, that the, um, the Chiari community is familiar with. Um, we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Um, ventral decompression, otherwise known as a transoral or endoscopic transnasal approach, that, that's another tool that, that's used much less frequently. Um, surgery on a syrinx, um, not at this stage, not usually our initial treatment for Chiari and syringomyelia, 
Sometimes it's done uh, if Chiari decompression uh, does not is not effective in treating syringomyelia, but it's certainly not our, our go-to first treatment for, for syringomyelia. Um, others, uh, CSF shunt, and by that I mean like a VP shunt or a VA shunt, something like that, to divert the spinal fluid from the head elsewhere to be absorbed. And then spinal fusions, either for spinal deformity, um, as we've talked about earlier, or occasionally for instability at the junction of the, the head and the spine, or an occipital cervical fusion, OC fusion. But if you really drill down into posterior fossa decompression, uh, we're also talking about not just that the operation is done, but how's the operation done. And this is where things really get a little tricky, because there are many different operative variations. Is it an extradural decompression? And if so, how is that done? Is, there, is the dura opened? And if the dura is opened, are there any of a variety of intradural maneuvers? People will lice any adhesions. They will look for an arachnoid veil, which is a little covering over one of the spinal fluid outflow tracts. Um, they may cauterize the cerebellar tonsils to shrink them back up into a more normal location or, or even resect them. Some sur surgeons will leave stents in the fourth ventricle to assist with drainage long term. Others will leave the dura open, which is that spinal that, that layer of tissue that covers the spinal fluid spaces. Other, other surgeons will close it. Some will close it partially. Some will close it with a graft. What kind of graft do you use? Is it, is it autologous, meaning from your own body, or is it from cadaveric, or is it uh, bovine, uh, synthetic? Um, there's any number of variations here, and that really diminishes uh, our ability to make major inferences into the effectiveness of different uh, surgical techniques. Some people will upfront, mean and right at the initial surgery, uh, have a fusion procedure. Others will put some titanium mesh down to uh, minimize the defect from the surgery itself. Some people use intraoperative MRI scan or ultrasound. Others uh, will use endoscopy or electrical signals being sent up and down. And it's just, it's very variable how surgeons like to do it. And um, so I'm sure that if you have 10, 10 patients in a room who had surgeries at 10 different centers, it'll be done to 10 different ways. So it's just high, highly variable. Um, in general, I think we classify these into posterior fossa decompression, uh, an extradural, PFD or uh, a durotomy, uh, PFDD, and this is just sort of a general schematic of how it's done. Removing the base of the skull, oftentimes removing the back part of C1 uh, based on the MRI scan, and then removing this fibrous band here uh, that is right at the junction of the, the head and, and the spine. Uh, oftentimes if the dura is opened, again, uh, it's opened in a uh, and you can see here that this is a cartoon of the cerebellar tonsils projecting downward, uh, and then a graft is sewn in um, here, you can see. Now, this is an overwhelming slide with a lot of detail, so I'm just gonna sum it up and just say, basically, a lot of people have studied whether to open the dura, which is one of the critical steps, or not, and the answer is we, we're not sure uh, which is better. Um, uh, one seems to have a higher complication rate, um, but may have a, a may be more effective, so it's it's just hard to know, and uh, that's the basis of the trial that Dorothy referenced before. The one thing we know for sure is there are complications with uh, treatment of Chiari and syringomyelia, um, uh, and one way to get at this is not look at uh, one surgeon's experience, which is um, how we've traditionally done things <coughs> in neurosurgery, but to look across large populations of, of how things have been done. Um, so in order to kind of take a more expansive view, um, this study looked at, um, used the administrative billing databases from three states, um, New York, uh, California, and Florida, and came up with 2,000 patients and uh, looked at 90-day complication rates, and surgical and medical complications. And medical complications are usually right off the bat um, uh, within the first few days low rate of medical complications, but you can see this rate of surgical complications is an unacceptably high rate of 20%, essentially. And those tend to not just be right around the date of surgery, but to uh, increase over time. Um, there are certain risk factors for having problems like hydrocephalus and obesity. Um, and those are things that we're trying to drill down on is how can we um, help with the efficacy of the surgery. 
Um, so I, I kind of wanted to take this last portion to talk about any questions you might have. And um, I, I, I did want to say thanks. There are a lot of people who've contributed to the clinical work we've been doing, to uh, some of this clinical research and helping develop these instruments and scales. Um, and they, they include uh, the Park Reeves Syringomyelia Research Consortium, ASAP and Tonker Chiari, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research, um, and then various other funding uh, organizations at the local and uh, national level. Uh, I really want to take a minute to say uh, thanks to CSF and especially to Dorothy and Kathy. Uh, for coming in um, from New York and Cleveland, respectively. Thank you, and for helping us to organize this really important um, group here uh, to provide support to um, the community, so thank you for, for that. I want to say thanks to Carrie, who's in the back of the room, who really did the organization uh, from our standpoint, um, and especially the patients and families who have been included in some of these things we're talking about, but also um, those um, that are just in the community that we've been able to, to work with. Thanks. Yes. I have a question about the size of the syrinx. Is it always the case that the larger the syrinx, the more complex your symptoms, or can a smaller syrinx cause a much problem? So, you know, the, the answer to that is we don't know, but I'll t I hate saying that we don't know, so I'm going to give you some general rules. We generally think of a syrinx or, or a fluid with less than two millimeters is probably not causing a lot of problems. If it's more than two, this is a general rule of thumb. Um, if it's more than two millimeters in diameter, it's more likely to cause problems. And it, the larger the syrinx, then the more the problems is a general rule of thumb. Yes? Um, so on the previous slide, um, with complications, yes. um, diabetes was listed. Yes. So I was just curious what you had to say about that, because I was sure. diagnosed with diabetes four months after my surgery, sure. um, and I haven't been able to find a lot of it. Right. Well, this here is mainly talking about complications that happen as a result of surgery, and what, what this shows is that diabetes puts you at risk of having additional problems um, related to the surgery, so you might be in the hospital longer and develop a blood clot, or you might have problems with blood sugar management or it may cause problems with really to your kidney function or other complications. This doesn't really get at any relationship between Chiari, Syringomyelia, or diabetes itself. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that, that you say that. So I don't think anybody knows about that relationship. And no. I, so I really don't. You know, one of the things that we've done uh, in the pediatric population is we've collected data on a thousand patients uh, and I, I can tell you what I can do is see how many of those thousand um, have diabetes. It's an interesting question I haven't been asked before. Thank you. And I would say the same about hypertension. For a young child to develop hypertension immediately after surgery is really odd as well. So I, I can tell you, uh, I personally have seen that um, in a number of cases. Um, and I don't have a great explanation for it. I could, I could probably provide an argument that maybe if there's uh, compression of the brain stem, that's likely to cause cardiovascular blood pressure, heart rate uh, changes, and that could be responsible for it. Syringomyelia could also be responsible for it. But I've seen that, and I don't think anybody's ever really studied that, to my knowledge, in any great depth. Yes. Um, before my son's surgery, he was having memory loss, and where teachers <coughs> had to help him to find the boys' restroom and then go back to his classroom. And then after surgery, we noticed that something happened with the short-term memory. Yes. So if things don't get in long-term, we have issues with short-term memory, and, and he has ADHD. And he also has um, sensory issues, almost autistic. I have a few comments about that. The first thing is, uh, last week at one of the lectures in the Stanford <coughs> lecture uh, by Jerry Grant, a colleague of ours in St at Stanford, gave a lecture that's available online. I watched it myself yesterday <laughs> um, in preparation for this. Uh, so he gave a lecture uh, on Chiari and the mind. 
and he talks and addresses a lot of these relationships that aren't exactly clear uh, about the relationship to memory loss, which we also see here <coughs> uh, in this patient reported. And, and again, this gets to the fact that as surgeons, we haven't really been paying attention to what you guys are saying. You know what I mean? We haven't been doing that. So in some ways, this is an incredible registry, and to know that it's out there is, is really, you know, eye-opening to me and I know to Dr. Grant and, and everyone. That being said, so I would encourage you to watch that on the CSF website. It's That's easy good. to find. But the other thing is that in our own registry of over a thousand patients, we have seen a high rate of ADHD, uh, of memory loss, and other problems. So there's something there. And, uh, you know, there are all these novel MR techniques to study the connections between um, the cerebellum and the brain, which I think Dr. Grant and others will be using uh, to, to study those interplay so we can under that interplay so we can understand those things better. So. How do you take that information as far as memory loss and involve the schools? Because I've been trying, my son has it as well. Right. And it's very hard to get them to understand that it's not his fault that he can't right. retain information. Remember? Right. So it's so funny I, that, um, so Kathy and Dorothy came in yesterday and we had lunch. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this, and Kathy, I think, brought this up. And I said the next meeting that we're going to have in July, I think tentatively July, yeah. uh, we're going we're to have somebody come that knows more about that than me. Okay. Okay. Uh, some, a, a psychologist, I have somebody in mind <coughs> that we're going to ask to come and talk to you guys about that. Two things. Number one, mm -hmm. maybe kind of in more detail, understanding <coughs> why it's, that problem occurs. Mm -hmm. Number two, understanding before and after surgery, how likely that is to uh, improve. And number three, what are the mechanisms to communicate that to the school? In the meantime, what I think, what we do here, and I know you're in Osage, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure many hospitals do this. We happen to have somebody here who can assess your child, develop, uh, they do a painstakingly long report uh, it's a long day of testing for your child. It's not easy. Uh, it's three hours or more. Um, but the, what they do is they generate a report uh, that, that basically describes all the areas of relative weakness and all the areas of relative strength. And, and you give that to your school. And they should be obligated to provide um, some education in that way. And if they're not obligated, then you can communicate back to your doctor's office like us. And we can communicate to them. It's almost like he can read, or he, he can't read and remember anything, but if he hears a lecture, he remembers everything. Right. He cannot read and retain any information. Right. He can't sit down and read a book and know what it's about. So, okay. I would, you know, I would strongly recommend that you see somebody, like I said, we have somebody here, and they have them at other institutions as well, yeah. but what they can do is identify exactly kind of what the problem is, and then you can tailor your educational strategies to that problem. And, and then in areas where he's got relative strengths, you can you know, not focus your time there, but in these specific areas. Because I think uh, the school system and the educational resources that are out there are great broadly, but aren't great for specific deficits unless they're pointed out. Yeah. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. So next, in July. Yes. yes. Um, is the prevalence of QR in more um, like higher in males over females, or is it uh, we believe in general it's higher in females, mm -hmm. um, and if you look at this is this is just a survey. I don't think I, yeah, I didn't include it here. But the people who completed the survey, eighty-seven <coughs> percent females. Um, but but the the, the incidence of QR it depends a little bit on when it presents, like when you actually are <laughs> diagnosed or become symptomatic and get diagnosed with it. But there does seem to be a female predominance. And to expand on that question, what about ethnic background? Oh, oh, uh, ethnic oh, background? Ethnic groups. Is it more prominent? So, so the only thing I can say is that I don't really know how prevalent it is in eth different ethnic backgrounds, but I can tell you, based on work that I didn't show you today that's part of that Florida, California, New York, that the ability to, or the, the resources that are spent in terms of treating Chiari are definitely focused in the Caucasian population. But that could be because of other factors. Is that what I'm I, yeah, I think it, it's probably a complex thing with healthcare resources, uh, referrals, you know, ability uh, to access medical care, all sorts of different things. So I, I don't really have a, an answer. 
for you specifically other than to say that certainly we're treating people that with quite a disparity. I have another question. The uh, neurosurgeons and children's are phenomenal, first of all. But I'm curious, what, support, what additional work is being done to help um, the general practitioners better be able to identify some of these symptoms so they're caught earlier? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, one that I haven't, I mean, I've thought about in general terms, but I haven't specifically addressed. You know, this, as Dorothy said, this is an area that I really try to improve, and, and I will personally see if we can develop a plan for that. Um, I would love to be a part of that think, initiative, that effort, because I think that's really the foundation to help these children have better outcomes. Again, the right. doctors in the neurosurgeon area fabulous. No problem there, but how can we get them there quicker when we know that they're going to have to need those surgeries? It's, it's a great point, and I would say right now, if I had to guess, I would say, um, Dorothy, yeah, do you want I was just going to say, so that's what we're doing down at NUSC. We're bringing in all different levels of physicians for a considered Chiari educational need. That's, um, so we can definitely you can definitely do something similar. Here. Here. And we're doing it in Cleveland in April 21st. That's, a, that's an excellent point that you bring up. It's something, even, even beyond educating, I wonder if there isn't something we can do by uh, mailing brochures to pediatricians and yeah. something where they don't yeah. have to track yeah. uh, with kind of bullet points on what the symptom, key symptoms would be. I th I, thank you for bringing it up. That's great. I just, yes. we had a hard time getting him diagnosed. It was a very rough road. And when we were telling the pediatrician and a neurologist at Mercy Hospital how he was having pain from head to toe, um, fainting issues, he would just fall to the ground. Um, sometimes immediately when he'd wake up from sleeping all night. And it was very hard. We only were allowed an EEG by the neurologist, but he wouldn't hear me, like, I'm like, he needs an MRI, something, he's in pain, you know, he's suffering, and they, they wouldn't allow it, this one, the doctor would not allow it, the MRI, and what had him on the right track is Dr. David Callahan, noticed his pulse was low, and he had an abnormal pulse rate, and that's what got us that MRI, and the detection, it, it was a miracle. It just tells you how much that even I, who work so you know much on this, we really we really don't know. Um, yeah. I, I really like the idea of what you guys have both said of trying to educate our local, mm -hmm. regional yeah. pediatricians, and and I know that we're kind of a lot of these questions have to do with children, but I think that would go for general practitioners yes. as well. Yeah. 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 Yes. Ma I'm kind of expanding on this a little bit. I myself have carry, but my kids have never been tested, and I have three of them. They don't really show any symptoms right now, the 9, 14, and 26. My 14-year-old does have late EDS, and he definitely I mean, is very EDS. What, should we just let it go because they're not really showing symptoms, or should we get them tested because carry can be passed down or you know, is it a good idea to just say okay let's just look before the symptoms show up right so so I, I can tell you what my practice has been okay. and I can't tell you what other people are doing uh, in that sort of situation just to sort of revisit these numbers if you have it there's somewhere around a maybe a 10% chance that somebody else in your family would have it, you know, 7 to 12 percent chance that okay. somewhere in that range so it's a relatively small uh, number if you see two people in one family, which we definitely see a lot, uh, then then you know I, I'm more aggressive about screening people. I, I think that if one of if one of your children had a significant headache, for example, mm -hmm. or something that that you thought was suspicious in general, I have uh, screened them at that point mm -hmm. uh, because then you have symptoms and a family history. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's right or wrong, I I don't know. Um, and then, so w why would I? Why would we take that approach? I think the reason is because about three and a half percent of the people, if you take 
everybody in St. Louis and do an MRI scan. Our study suggests that three and a half percent of people will have some uh, degree of uh, tonsillar position problem. But you won't do surgery on them probably unless they had symptoms um, in general. In general, there's some exceptions to that if they had a syrinx, a big syrinx. So. Um, but in general, you know, I think that the information is useful to know, but it probably wouldn't change how you manage as a, you know, as a physician. So I, 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 I would say um, be vigilant, looking for symptoms, and if they arise, then that might be the time to, to do it. Well, very symptomatic, so. We had a question at the back. Yeah, I have a question on syrinx. So in, in the case of a syrinx and um, spinal fusion, post-op, um, is there anything we should be looking for? I mean, she had a significant syrinx before she had spinal fusion. Is there, is there anything after the fact that needs to And there was a Chiari, too? No Chiari, actually. No Chiari. So, um, and Dr. Grinette is an expert in this too, so she can comment if necessary. But, but there are two, two considerations. Number one, if it's a long segment fusion, the titanium will oftentimes obscure any ability to visualize the series. So the titanium screws or stainless steel, or whatever they use, at least through that area where the, the instrumentation was, is oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes limited. So an MRI is not always that helpful. The other, the other thing to say is for people who have a condition called AIS or adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, we're learning that a high percentage of those have a small syrinx uh, that's unlikely to get bigger or smaller over time. Um, and I, Dr. Grinnett may know the exact, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's a fairly, you know, it's a common thing. Um, so in general, uh, I think if she has a spinal fusion and she doesn't have a Chiari and she doesn't have a tethered cord, which would be the other thing to think about with the series, then probably we wouldn't necessarily screen again just because of that problem with the MRI scan. Chris, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. What's a small, what would be a small series? I, I would, you know, I'm sort of riffing a little bit here, but three millimeters maybe. Oh, three or so, See, I always felt like I was crazy thinking this, but is there a correlation between barometric pressure and pain and Chiari and headaches? And because I noticed that the changes, everybody in the support groups feel it the same way I do. What is the correlation between that? I don't think we have a great understanding of that. I, I've, okay. heard that I've heard that for, for sure. I've also heard that with hydrocephalus, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, don't, I don't know that. I, I can look into that for you, but I, I don't know that there's okay. any good data on that. I have a couple of questions. How do you get your slides? <laughs> the second one is, my daughter has always been asymptomatic, but she still has a syrinx after her decompression. Do you know long term since she's still asymptomatic? Any problems with just leaving it alone? So answer the first question is, it'll be on the, the entire presentation with me droning on in my mon mon monotonical <laughs> voice will be on the <laughs> website. Um, and the second question is um, that it depends on the age of your, your daughter, right? Uh, so the only thing that I think is, um, the only thing you have to be vigilant about is spinal deformity. And if um, if she's beyond the age of adolescence, she's she had her cerebral decompression at five. Okay. And um, her syrinx was her whole spine, and now it's just cervical, and she's thirteen now. So. But totally asymptomatic. Right. They're, they're all sorts of harbingers of, of skeletal maturity, like x-rays and then <coughs> different puberty markers and things. Once she reaches skeletal maturity, then the chance of the spinal deformity progressing is low, not zero, but low. Uh, so the question is, is she at skeletal maturity? And, and that's a, you know, somebody would probably have to assess her for that. But there's some, like I said, there's certain cardinal things that you think about for that that have to do with uh, maturation of female, for example. Um, and uh, so I think that, in general, everybody does a little bit differently, even among the different <coughs> physicians of my practice here. Uh, the neurosurgeons do things a little bit differently. In, in the situation that of your daughter, if she had Chiari surgery when she was five, I would, and this is just my own practices, I follow people very closely for five years, and then not as closely, but continuously through, at least through puberty. Um, and during that time, I do periodic imaging to make sure that the serum hasn't changed in size. Um, 
for the reason that um, someone else mentioned that sometimes uh, post-operative scar tissue can deceive you a little bit and reproduce cervix down the road. So that, that's just my, my practice. Other people believe that that is a little bit of a, a waste of healthcare resources and, and just don't scan anymore. So uh, it, it's very, I'm sorry to say. That, that, that's, the, I guess. No, what she we're sees you and you yeah. scan her and she's fine. Perfect. I'm just wondering long term, because we've had one neurosurgeon that wanted to drain it, but she's totally asymptomatic. Right. So in general, uh, and, and I can just tell you again, this is just me, but in somebody who's asymptomatic, I think most people would agree that there is significant risk to doing uh, to draining a um, and um, the, of you know you are actually making an incision in the spinal cord, uh, which is not great. So in general, if somebody's well, then we leave it alone. But we you know continue to monitor for these things. I, I just wasn't sure if like in 10, 15 years, if we just leave it alone, is there potential just for the fluid? like the neural issues that you were talking about? Models. Yeah, so um, those sorts of longitudinal studies, we don't really know a lot about because MRI's only been available for you know, you know, a couple decades. Uh, so we don't know the answer to that. But for sure, in, in this case, um, you know, I think that the risk of surgery, in my opinion, is higher than the risk of watching. What if the syrinx actually increases after surgery? Yeah, I think I, um, in that situation, I think you have to, uh, first of all, if the child is okay, then I don't think it's unreasonable to continue to watch, I think, but I think you have to be very vigilant to make sure the decompression is adequate. Um, and that may mean additional MRI studies like the ones I showed here. Um, sometimes we do a dye study, uh, or sometimes it means revising if it's continuing to increase over time, I think you definitely might want to consider a revision decompression. I know in our situation, um, my son had surgery at three, which was decompression. He had a very, very large series, the whole cord. And um, after the decompression, nothing changed with the series. He has no symptoms. But then at five, he started having, his symptoms were never headache or anything. He had chest pain, <laughs> severe chest pain. And um, then his spine curved, and that's how we found it. But then his spine curved more at five, and then he had chest pain again, so he had to go in and they had to make a passageway for spinal fluid. Right. Because he didn't have right. his passageway. And he became hydrocephalic after that. But his spine is still remain huge. The syrinx is still huge. Um, how often is it that there's pockets of fluid instead of one full syrinx? Because they're not sure with them. Right. I would say that full one or pockets. I would say that happens all the time. It does uh, it? Maybe I'm not, I don't mean 100%, but it happens really, really commonly. Instead More often than one not, full. Yeah, there are all these little layers there. In, in your son's case, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if somebody's undergone a, it sounds like he did decompression, then he had a stent, is the way I'm reading what you're hearing, I'm hearing what you're saying. If this is, if there was progression beyond that, those are the kinds of situations where we think putting in, uh, you know, doing the serum surgery sometimes can be a benefit. Um, so that's, that's one. Now he's now 17, mm -hmm. um, and he hasn't had an MRI since I think he was 12 or 13. Um, and at that time, it had not changed. It was still huge. But they're doing one before he leaves for college this summer right. to see if everything's still stable. Um, but he's never had symptoms, never numbness, nothing. The only symptom he ever had was a spine sure. curving and severe chest pain from, I guess, the cranial nerve Right, right. So, you know, I we did have a doctor say a long time ago, you need to get this fluid out of here. We need to start at the bottom and move our way up and release that fluid to the like The doctors here were like, no, he doesn't have symptoms, don't do that. Right. So we, <laughs> we went with them <laughs> right. um, because it seemed a lot less. We can see that severe. this is, it's just so hard for us to, as nurses. <coughs> it's not like one person's necessarily right or wrong, it's just that we don't really have the answers to all these right. questions and everybody's a little bit different. And so uh, I wish, I wish we, I wish we had the answer to all these questions. Oh, we had a crystal ball. Right. <laughs>
Do you think the syringolinia would um, do something to your eyes, or is it just that the, the sherry would do it? So what what kind of things in your eyes? Um, just curious. My daughter has got syringolinia, but her eyes, she's ever been having problems with them. They'll get really big and then go to pinpoint, and then they'll get big and go to pinpoint. But now since we're here, the chair, the sherry or whatever. We're thinking that that might be with her eyes instead of the Well, so eye movements are complicated, but, but uh, and again, I, for most of these questions, I'm sort of generalizing on a little bit right. of the information, so please don't take everything too seriously. But Chiari oftentimes has eye movement difficulties, like nystagmus, uh, like this. Uh, that's a common, common situation with Chiari. Um, if there's severe compression, it can affect the pupillary size. But even the syrinx can affect pupillary size because it's a complex network of nerves from the chest region through some relay stations that back up into the eyes mm -hmm. that can also affect pupillary size. So and it really could be either, I think. And her blood pressure went up a whole lot. Mm -hmm. that day, so. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's certainly it's hard to know. Um, could be related to the syringomyelia if it's in the chest or if it's in the brainstem, one of those two areas, I would say. As far as we know, it's not mother up by the brain. And then are you going to branch out and do adults, or are you just only? <laughs> so I used to, and, and I may have seen some of you guys up until two years ago, I did adults. Uh, and, and then, you know, my partner left. Uh, my professional partner in uh, neurosurgery, one of them left, and things got very busy. So I, I started to focus almost exclusively on kids. Uh, but I do expect to go back to having the adult clinic again. Now, do you work with Dr. Bowling in New York at all? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't work with him professionally, but I know him. Dorothy knows him very well. We, we do know him very well. Uh, uh, we take conference calls together all the time. Good, because since my daughter's had a week, I have been on the internet and not stay off. Right. So right. I can't. I mean, it's been right. two years. So and he is a real good, you know, I Google the best uh, doctor for Sarah Mill. You came up first. So we want the best. So I was just curious. Yeah, no, he, he, he is great. Uh, I, I do know him personally. I think he's a very nice guy and a great doctor. Well, we live in Carlisle, so we've got he, to stay That's here. a far, a long way from Carlisle. Right, so we need to stay right here. And, but I was glad that we do know him and you guys probably all work a little bit together. We do. He's part of this CDE project. Yeah. That, in fact, he and I are, we co-lead one of the sections for uh, okay. the CDE yeah. project. Yeah. That's good. Yes, ma'am. I know I was talking to Dr. Smith, who's our doctor. Yes. And he said that um, that he would see my son through, while well, he was in college. He would be, right. you know, this is a children's hospital. He would right. see him. Is there, I know right now you're with kids. Is there somebody that you guys do refer people to as they get older? I mean, is there a certain group that you guys trust? Sure. So in general, at, when we've been following patients for a long time, we, we not you guys, maybe you guys, but we have a hard time cutting the cord. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because it, it may seem like it's a one-sided relationship, but it's not. It's two-sided. Uh, and so we have a hard time you know, letting go. Go on to another Right, right. There are uh, here, in, well, I only know WashU, there are many other hospitals in the area that are very good, but in WashU there are at least three or four neurosurgeons that take care of Chiari and Syringomyelia as well. Um, and um, so I can give you a name afterwards, I'm sure Dr. Dr. Smith, yeah. Dr. Smith is one of my yeah. uh, partners here at St. Louis Children's yeah. Hospital, and he's fantastic. And, and this one. Um. Okay, our 23-year-old uh, son was diagnosed with a serum, sort of an incidental finding and maybe you know, seemingly idiopathic, uh, with a 7 millimeter uh, with 2.2 fluid. And um, so we're in a watch and wait with, with Dr. Dacey, sort of every two years getting an MRI. Will, uh, I mean, one of my big things that keeps me up at night, will this progress, what will happen, and should we screen our other children? So in general, uh, the, the, the biggest study on uh, idiopathic syringomyelia, the natural history, does it progress or not, is actually a combined study, Dr. Smith and um, in a group at Harvard. And 
there's about a 10% chance that it'll change in some way afterwards, whether that's getting smaller or larger. So it's not zero, but there's a 90% chance it'll stay the same without being a problem. And to test our other children for anything, or if we're not sure if it's idiopathic or not, so. Yeah, so I, I would say it, um, it depends a little bit on, uh, somebody here had talked about EDS and uh, Marfanoid uh, symptoms, which are sort of kind of long skinny uh, uh, body habitus. And um, if your siblings have uh, some of those, and I think that might prompt you to think about it, but in the absence of symptoms like we were talking about earlier, uh, we, we typically wouldn't necessarily do that. extremes of hot and cold before surgery. After surgery, you still have that, but then you also now have like neuropathic itch, not really a neuropathic pain, but right. a neuropathic right. itch. And, and treating that, and does that ever improve? Is it the nerves just misfiring because they're trying to heal? Yeah, so I can comment on that. And a couple of the people that changed my thinking on this are in the audience, so I'm not going to point them out. Um, but a couple, uh, after seeing a few people here today in my clinic after surgery, it prompted us to develop that Chiari Severity Index. And that Chiari Severity Index suggests people that have those sorts of symptoms are not as likely to have an improvement in those symptoms as the headaches. Um, that's sort of what, what that CSI was showing. So the end of that is uh, I would love to tell you there's a 100% chance that that will get better, uh, but uh, the, the truth of the matter is that you may be left with some numbness, or in your case, itching, which I have not heard a lot about itching, but I have heard a lot about numbness and then pain, uh, and that, to, to our current understanding, doesn't always respond to, to the surgery. So even though before surgery there maybe wasn't it's almost like a... Oh, I've seen this. A deep mm -hmm. almost like it's a, to the bone, like an issue just can't get to. So and it's more like when the body, like if you're physically like, removed, it just sort of... Oh, yes, I have it right now. She has it too. She has it too. I have it right now. But is the treatment like gabapentin, or is there any form of magic therapy that's beneficial for it? So, for sure, the to get back to this, I've definitely seen people go from having numbness to having pain afterwards. Uh, I have not seen the itch, although I, some of my patients here I know are now saying they have itch. So. Uh, it, goes, it goes back to me not listening to my patient, I guess. But uh, no, but uh, I, I, seriously, I think that we need to, I, I need to look at itch um, and sort of see if more people are suffering from that. But the answer to that is if, if I, you know, if it were my decision, I would probably at least try gabapentin and see if that helps. Is, to piggyback off her question about the nerve damage, mm -hmm. is there addition of research or other um, resources you can direct us to of someone who is doing research on regeneration of the nerves to try to get that back? To my knowledge, nobody is doing that. Um, but uh, Dorothy, do you know of anybody doing that? Well, there to uh, decompression. So tech centers did their industry stuff um, twice. Yeah. Is working with new generation nurse. They don't have anything yet. So the answer to the question is nobody has any results. They are looking at things, and the Miami Project is doing right. some regeneration work down there. So, so it doesn't sound like it's imminent anyway. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have all the answers. I really am sorry. And one last, one comment, um, just for Ray, I hope with some of the parents I saw with the younger children, my daughter also had some of the memory issues and went from an average B student and dropped down to a D student three years post surgery and she's on the honor roll. So Ray, I hope. Congratulations. Ray, I hope. I think someone mentioned syndrome of Correlation. You mean in a developing child, for example? Um, or? He's 14. Mm -hmm. He had a compression when he was three. Pretty large whole spine series. Right. No change after surgery. Yes. Pretty asymptomatic. Um, weakness a little. And did you just mention something about long skinny? Yeah, so uh, the, the one thing that over, the, I'd say, the last maybe two to four years is people have 
come to understand that the incidence of having problems like the ones we're talking about today seems to be more common in people that have um, uh, variants in their connective tissue disease, uh, t connective tissue um, system, and that lends people to be kind of have uh, a longer, a skinnier body habitus, and um, there is a condition called EDS or Ehlers Danlos and uh, Marfan's and various other things that, in typically, if somebody has Chiari. In, in my in, in my clinic, if somebody comes in with a Chiari or Sphingomyelia and has that sort of body habitus, I'll generally have them see a geneticist just to make sure that there's not you know some contribution um, of that. And that's not to say there's a lot you can do about it other than be more vigilant as you think about this process going forward. As I mentioned before, in the Park Reeves project, which I, is based here in WashU. Um, We've definitely seen a, a, a large percentage of people uh, who have sensory issues, autism, ADHD. These are things that, that we're trying to spearhead and think a little bit about. Um, but for, for your child, I'm sure they've already been seen by uh, a neuro, neurodevelopmental psychologist or psych neuropsychologist. Uh, but that's, that's sort of the angle we take to make sure that their school, as I said earlier, is being targeted to certain areas of relative weakness and, not focusing in your system. Really the neuropsychologist. The neuropsychologist. I was never <coughs> so if you're interested, I can give you a name. Like I said, there, there are many others. So. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, my son sees you. We, we don't have Chiari. We have the Cernix, length of the spinal cord, asymptomatic at this point, has another neck condition. Um, when we see other doctors and we explain his condition, they always ask, does he have Chiari too? The, the basic MRI that you've done to diagnose this other problems, would that also diagnose Chiari? Yes. Or it would? Uh, although, you, we, you, if, if you want, you can, um, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you could remind me of, of his name, <coughs> then I can double check that. Okay. But, but I'm sure. Well, and, and I'm very, yeah. I, I'm not saying that yeah. I think you've misdiagnosed, right, I don't right. think that at all. But yeah. I'm just wondering why all these other doctors keep saying he's probably, and they say he's probably got Chiari too. And I think that relates to some of his other so, issues. So Chiari 2 is almost exclusively seen in people who have open spina bifida. Oh, no, I didn't mean... Uh, you mean yeah. Chiari also. Just yeah. Chiari also, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> so, so in most cases, uh, a, an MRI of the spine will include the Chiari area. Okay. And, and I'm sure... I, I would be, you know, I, I would like to have the name to verify for myself. Okay. But I, I would be surprised, you know. Well, and I, I tend to be very uptight. So. And I thought of <laughs> <laughs> and again, I'm not saying that at all, but like when they were saying the pediatricians and these other doctors don't seem to know, all these doctors I go to keep telling telling me my kid probably has Chiari too, and I'm going, well, I know, we've never been told that. Well, so. well so, so a Chiari malformation is the single most common reason for having syringomyelia. Oh, okay. Like 70% of the cases of syringomyelia have Chiari. So, and, and I hope that I've done this, but, but you would never consider syringomyelia without having first considered, really, I always look for four or five things, Chiari, tethered cord, any abnormality up and down the spine, and then I, I know many of you have had, uh, I always do an MRI with contrast too, um, as a, either at the first time or as a second follow-up, just to make sure that there's not an inflammatory condition. Or, and I, I'm sure it's not a tumor, but, but for sure that's why I do that contrasted MRI scan systematically so we never miss anything. The contrast is with an IV though, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I know he's never had that. Yeah, so, so when we do a follow-up, usually we'll do that as the part of the follow-up MRI. Okay. Yeah. That's, the, in it, that, that's really just a, a healthcare resource issue because we can't, generally if an MRI is done, we can't just send them back and get another MRI right. scan. So when we do an interval follow-up scan, we generally do a contrast. Okay. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, she's had two decompression surgeries and then one on her syrinx and a shot put in, but she's got thick scar, scar tissue on her neck. Is there anything we can do for that to help it out? And do you mean just superficially on her neck, like a cosmetic thing, or do you it, mean deep within? Deep within, and we've had a few massages here and there that, that have helped. We've tried physical therapy, but it just really is tension building up here and all the way through her head. We just want to know if there's, we talked about surgery with a doctor, and he said probably not, but is there anything else we can do for the scar tissue? Um, not for, obviously I'd have to 
see her and think about it a little bit, but in general for scar tissue, it's surgery. Um, uh, yeah. that, that's mainly what you're talking about. If there is a component of muscle spasm, mm -hmm. then therapy or those sorts of things help. Occasionally, I have had injections in the muscles that have helped to relax them. But if it's scar tissue, then it's surgery, or generally surgery or, or, or nothing. But therapy can be useful even then too. Is there surgery, if there is surgery that can be done on that? Or is it just if it's too close to the spine? Or? Well, uh, for sure you could think about going back in and removing the scar, maybe with a plastic surgeon if there's a cosmetic issue too. So. Gosh, don't care about it. It's just the way it hurts and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I just have one more question. So can you give your thoughts to, um, you know, post-surgery, everything looks fine on imaging, but all the symptoms still remain? Is that Are they mainly headache symptoms or? In nerve. So uh, I kind of, I guess I come back to uh, this same question, which is that nerve pain tends to not respond as well to PRE decompression as the headaches. And, um, and that's what we've been talking about is that it can even, in my experience, um, it can change in the way it affects you. I'm learning now that my patients have itch, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, go from numbness or tingling to pain to itch or um, to pain, and it's just that the neural symptoms don't tend to improve as much. Now that's not to say we shouldn't be doing it because they'd probably get, be getting worse, 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 worse if we didn't, if the hearings were too large, but I think, you know, again, that CSI is, is sort of helping us to understand that that those symptoms don't respond quite as well, at least based on that 150 patients. I'm sorry, don't have better, better news for you. What would it be that would cause chronic pain in carrying? Because like, I know that a lot of carriers that I speak with just have chronic pain all the time. Y yeah. Is uh, that just a normal carrying thing? Well, so um, I'm not sure if this is still up, but chronic pain is a major feature. We like to think that our surgery is 100% effective in getting rid of the headaches, especially if they're back here. Mm -hmm. But I, I've definitely seen my fair share of patients that have chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know. We like to tell ourselves that it would have been, well, it would have been terrible if we hadn't done surgery. Right. Um, so I, I, it, is a, it is a feature. And, you know, like I said, I'm happy to talk to you offline. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, if you already had brain surgery, what does a tortured look like? Like, what does a Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, so this is something that I deal with all the time and I'm happy to talk to you about it. So I, I would need to know, in order to tell you specifically, I would need to know a little bit more about how your bones look, if you've had x-rays if you, to, to show that your bones are stable, uh, and maybe know what it looked like before surgery. But your doctor should be able to do that. And the one thing I'll tell you, I was just telling Dorothy yesterday at lunch, that I was just came from a meeting where all uh, 150 neurosurgeons were together. We talked about return to play, and it's something that we're learning more about and are becoming more permissive. So I'm a neurosurgeon, so I happen to be against, even if you didn't have a Chiari, collision sports like football and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you should talk to your doctor, but I'd be willing to bet that short of that, um, that you'd probably be able to do all or much of what you'd like to do. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Did you? Um, I have a question. Um, so I have a, a searing, rather large, I also have a tumor and a synovial cyst. So we've just ruled out surgery as an option. But have you had any experience with um, like pacemaker, inner stem therapy? Because that's what's being suggested for for me because of the nerve damage from the searing. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I, I do know about those devices. Um, I, you know, I'm a pediatric person for the most part, so I haven't done them myself. I know that they can be effective for the treatment of pain. Uh, I know that it's not always a home run, but it is often very helpful. Um, but you know, I, and synovial cyst, and, and you said in a tumor, is mm -hmm. that right? And it's already been removed, or didn't need to be removed. Did not need to be removed. Is the, is the pain global, or is it just a small area? Um, well, I have a neurogenic bowel bladder from this, so 
that is hopeful. That so I get you know again I, I would probably need to see the films and, and understand more about it, but I know those devices do help people. Yes. I didn't even know there was such thing as a neuro <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, they're, they're, no, no, it's it's a it's a great thing. There, it's an it's an active area where people are trying to regenerate nerves, not from the spinal cord, but from uh, to the bladder. Little things like where you scratch your leg and that can empty your bladder and things like this. And did did you have another question? Or? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Sure. Okay, we can stay after two. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay. Great. Great. Can I just say something yep, before yep. I sit down? I just want to say thanks everybody for making the effort to come out tonight today because I know it's not easy and like I said, getting in and around and parking, many of you came from far away. So thank you and thanks for also uh, sharing details of your, your life with me. I certainly have learned a lot from people who I already <laughs> thought I knew. <laughs> yeah, so. yes, yes. I just want to say one thing. You can live a long time with it. I have uh, my syrinx is the full length of the cord, and I had the PRI surgery. And how long do you live with this? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lindbergh. What a great performance.